Hello and welcome to our next session on the Advanced Higher History course. This video today is going to be looking at the importance of warfare to Iron Age society in Northern Britain. In this section, we're going to learn about the different arguments both for and against the importance of Iron Age warfare to that period of Northern British history. By the end of this video, we should be able to explain the key points of the arguments, supporting them with evidence demonstrated through case studies and historiography, both for or against the theory that warfare was important to Iron Age Britain. We're going to take this knowledge that we pick up from this video today and apply it to source questions and to essay work a wee bit later on in the course. This is all about building up our knowledge of the Iron Age in Northern Britain at this time. So the question of the importance of warfare in late Iron Age pre-Roman Britain has produced differing views from historians. The period we're looking at here is very much 1st century BC, 1st century AD. So it's literally just as the Romans are starting to have contact, uh, recorded at least with the British people. There would have been trade happening first. The Roman trade ships visiting the, the coast, certainly along the southern coast of Britain, possibly working about the western coast of Britain too maybe even as far north as the likes of the Argyll coast. That initial contact develops over time into well, invasion, first of all through Julius Caesar, 55, 54 BC, and then almost a century later when the Emperor Claudius leads his great invasion in 43 AD, and the Romans subsequently work their way up through the British Isles over the following decades. This section is looking at what was going on in Iron Age society before the Romans arrive with a conquering army on these shores. So both sides of the argument here of whether or not Iron Age Northern Britain was or wasn't warlike have their own interpretations and they have their own evidence and arguments that they can deploy to support their view. So looking first at the reasons for Iron Age society being warlike. So if we look at this concept a wee bit more in depth, we can see that historians argue that war is built in, it's endemic to Celtic society, it's part of how they exist. Uh, the Roman geographer Ptolemy recorded in 150 AD that there were some 16 different tribes occupying northern Britain of what we would recognise as kind of modern day Scotland and obviously 16 different kind of regional power centres there's going to be some form of friction along those borders as they compete for resources or for prestige amongst each other. So to support this jockeying for, for power that it is likely to have happened then that obviously looks like warfare. So therefore you can argue, well, warfare is going to be uh, almost day-to-day -day existence in amongst these very barbaric and warlike Northern British peoples around at the time. Historians argue that warfare would have been essential to resolving disputes when you've got so many disparate power groups across, well, I guess what would seem like a very crowded landscape with 16 power units across one day Scotland, then without any overarching power being in charge, before the Romans arrive, eh? then if you're going to work out disputes, best way to do so, easiest way to do so perhaps, is to have a fight and fight it out. Strongest takes all. So warfare is therefore, under this argument, necessary to expand the tribe's territory. If a tribe is growing in power, they want to expand that power, expand their territorial limits, enforce their will over their neighbours, then that is going to lead to warfare. Now, as we go through this section today, there'll be loads of links to different short YouTube clips that are going to support what I'm talking about. I do recommend that you go and check these out. They are more than worthwhile to, to broaden in your understanding of what's going on this time. This link here will take you to a clip from the, the movie Troy, which has its good and its bad. But uh, the scene that I'm taking you to here is a battle of champions. Now, we think that often, rather than having a full-scale battle, which resource-wise would have been extremely expensive to both parties in terms of the amount of manpower that could potentially be lost, as well as the loss of resources and metal, the, the, the weapons that the soldiers are using should things go badly. To avoid that, there's also a method of dealing with that conflict Armies would take the field, they would square up against each other, it's more of a show of force than perhaps anticipating an actual fight, and they would deal with the matter through a battle of champions, so both sides would put forward their best fighters and then agree to abide by the result. So whichever champion won would be declared the winner of the, the conflict of the battle and the loser would bear the consequences, but not perhaps the casualties, which means that this conflict is not quite so damaging on society. So this YouTube video is an example of the movie Troy setting up a battle of champions between two prominent Greek warlords. Have a look. So other reasons for warfare being important. 
Warfare in Celtic society can be argued to be a pastime as well as a necessity. Now what does that mean? Warfare played a role in securing and maintaining the power of elite members of a social hierarchy. Now, in the hierarchy of the tribe, the more metal you had equates to the more wealthy you had. The more wealthy you had would have made you prestigious and respected, powerful within your tribe, within your people. When we have excavated the tombs of bodies from this era, we have come up with some very, very interesting paraphernalia that these people were wearing. Now this isn't exclusively perhaps in Britain, this is the wider, and I use this under due care term anyway, uh, the wider Celtic civilization across Europe at that time. Excavations from modern day France and Switzerland and so on turn up, uh, burials of this era with fantastic metal ornaments that these men are wearing. You can look at some of these fabulous helmets that these men have on here just now. Uh, we also see one is carrying a boar stand or uh, a banner, possibly to show off a symbol of a tribe. Um, these men look fabulous and that's going to be part of the, the whole paraphernalia that comes of war. It's about showing off the talent it would have taken to manufacture these items in an era before machines were able to help you to make this stuff. These men are showing off their power through their dress and war gives them the platform to do that. These men are showing how powerful they are, how powerful their tribe is, and they are securing the respect that they demand through warfare. Now, it may not be whole wide-scale battles being pitched out between different rival tribes. As I said, it may be about champions squaring up. But when an army appears with its war leaders decked out in just fabulous metal items like this, then it would have commanded respect from their enemies. If they have these kind of resources, then... Wow, what kind of power do these guys have? Got to be careful going up against them. Some more evidence for warfare would be Tacitus' account of the Mons Graupius battle talks of chiefs using chariots. Now, we haven't got to the Roman section of our course yet. Tacitus is one of our primary source Roman writers. He was writing at the very end of the first century AD, and his father in law was a general who'd commanded one of the major invasions of Northern Britain. So he had really, really good first-hand evidence of what it was like to be on campaign in Northern Britain. He wrote that down. He is our major, major uh, primary written source for Northern Britain this time. Now, the, the Celtic civilization of, of Northern Britain didn't write their histories down. They didn't have a, a written dialect. They appear to have passed things on orally and maintain a kind of oral history and culture for their people. So when they are basically lost in the mists of time, unfortunately, we don't have their version of events coming through. We do have this Roman one, although, as I said, Tacitus is, is kind of it. He is the main thing for this period. So even though we can question it as a single source with obvious bias, it's written from the point of view of an army trying to crush these people, Tacitus does give us... I guess very valuable first-hand evidence of a battle against Northern British peoples and he talks as I said about chiefs using chariots to get into battle so it seems as this picture shows here that chariots are prestige items they are the sports cars of their day this is your Maserati your Ferrari now we've excavated examples of these things and they are of quite advanced construction of their time so the suspension built into these things and they would have been operated by two people at a time a driver and some form of prestigious leader or warrior on the back of the chariot. Uh, we think, unlike in the movies where they just mow into formations of men with big horrible scythes on the wheels, cut people in half and that kind of thing, it's more likely that the chariots scooted around in front of an enemy formation and the warriors on the back launched javelins into the enemy. Now a spear thrown at distance, as you may have had a go at throwing a javelin in school and realised it just doesn't go that far. You need to get quite close to the enemy, however, it has quite a hefty punch. It could go through a shield, even a Roman one, and it is fairly deadly. If you take a hit anywhere in your body from a javelin, you are out of that fight. So they are dangerous, dangerous players, and we know the Romans hated going up against chariots. From my own opinion, the Battle of Mons Graupius is reputed to have taken place in the northeastern highlands of Scotland, and for me... I struggle a little bit having climbed a few hills and highlands in my day with the idea of chariots bouncing across hillside landscapes in Scotland because it's very tussocky and not 
not very even for a wheeled vehicle to go through. So I have my doubts about Tassus' account of, ta of chariots being used en masse before that battle, if it indeed took place next to a giant hill. But there you go, we seem to have a picture that they were used in Iron Age warfare. And there are examples of prestige and showing off. The Tassus in his piece, the story of the, the conquest of Northern Britain by his father-in-law Agricola. When he gets this, the set piece, this big climactic battle he had between the Romans and Northern Britons at uh, the Battle of Mons Graefius, he talks about the Caledonian war leader Calgacus. Now we don't know if Calgacus is a real figure or if he is a literary construct as in a made-up leader put in there by Tacitus to give a focal point for the, the enemy army. But Tastus called him Calgacus, and that translates to the swordsman. That's a very militaristic name, indicates that, if he was a real figure, that battle tactics and warfare must have played a part in Northern British society. If you're going to name people after weapons of war, then clearly warfare is a big deal. Further evidence for warfare is, as I said just before there, we do have excavated examples of these chariots, and this is a reconstructed one. This is the New Grange burial in Midlothian. This is buried with a tribal leader. It shows a prestige burial. He's basically getting buried with his sports car, so he can use it in the afterlife. And as you can see in the body of the chariot itself, there's almost like a red carpet on the, the platform that the driver and the, the charity behind him would stand on. That seems to have been a sprung surface. Often it might have leather straps in it that are strung between a wooden frame, or they might be of some other kind of woven fabric. But the idea is that they, they bounce and they flex as the chariot would go over uh, bumps and nobles in the track or on the, the hillside that it was being scooted across and it meant that the, the riders had some form of suspension so they weren't just being jarred about by the, the wheels rattling over the uneven landscape. This is very much a time before we have a hard surface roads in Northern Britain. The Romans brought that with them. Beforehand we have at best tracks so we're not looking at nice even surfaces that these things are going over. But clearly if we're digging them out of the ground they're being used. So yeah, this shows a tribal leader buried with his chariot. It's a prestige item. It's an item of war. Now, there's another wee video link here. Uh, I do encourage you to go and have a look at it. This one is taken from the movie The Eagle, which, just like Troy, has, has its uh, goods and its bads. But this scene is showing a Roman century of troops dealing with a Iron Age British chariot attack. Now you can see the fear portrayed in the Romans as they basically leg it in the video and flee, except for one um, silly bloke who decides to stay and fight. But you can see an idea of just how scary it must have been to go up against chariots if you're on foot, and uh, the effect of chariots in a battle. So go and have a look at that, please do. Now this, hopefully having just seen our little video clip there, is a reconstruction of that New Grange chariot in use. And you see the charioteers sitting back. We have possible evidence sometimes that they stood on the yoke of the chariot that joined the two horses together. The, the Celts are reputed to have been quite fabulous horsemen. The horses that are being used in a chariot are by no means the size of your average contemporary horse nowadays. The tusks, they would just seem as little ponies. We haven't gone through the phase yet where we have used intensive breeding practices to create giant medieval war horses. Horses are still fairly small. Quite hardy, quite tough, quite strong, but still quite small. So we've got the driver sitting down there and there would have been the warrior on the back of the chariot with spear or javelins to launch at the enemy as they scooted past. Now further evidence for what other things do we have other than, well, fancy metalworking helmets and chariots in the ground? Well, archaeologists have also buried up some other paraphernalia from warfare. Now this thing is the head of something called a carnix. Now it was unearthed in Deskford and it indicates the paraphernalia of warfare. This is basically, we think, more or less like a war trumpet used by the Iron Age peoples of Northern Britain. Now you're going to see a reconstruction of one of these six. Let's just bring it up. So this is what we have surviving. And archaeologists have reconstructed this from that relic. Now this is what it could have looked like. It's made of bronze. And it is basically a giant big trumpet. So someone's blowing into it at the other end. As you can see in the head of it, there is a kind of tongue-like structure. Now the tongue would have vibrated and flopped about when you blow into the, the thing and the head of it is like a, a sounding drum, like a reverberating chamber for the, the noise of the tongue kind of flopping about in the wind and it makes a really really loud and striking sound. So this we think was a war horn. Now when your army goes into battle if you can picture this member as a time before for the media that we have nowadays, before 
well, some people have got writing in their own world, but very much a time of, of magic and the natural world. By magic, I mean people's perception of, of scientific things and how they happened then. So people are probably far more likely to be impressed by by something that man can do. And in this case, the noise that this thing makes is is loud it's f and phenomenally eerie and unusual. You imagine a bank of these, three or four of these, playing on a hillside as an army moves down into battle, it would have freaked people clean out. Now this YouTube link here will take you to a link of a modern musician playing one of these things. I also know there is a guy in Spain who's got one of these and he likes to do kind of concerts playing it on the coronavirus lockdown. I've also got a wee video of him leaning out his flat window and playing it down the street in Spain. And the sound is just, it's just incredible. So please do follow this link. But this is an idea of the effort that people are putting into warfare to make this item. It takes an extremely skilled craftsman. Items like this we we couldn't really manufacture again in modern times until maybe a couple of hundred years ago. So there's a great deal of expertise in, in the making of this and to the price in manufacturing that metal at a time as well, it makes it a prestige item just in terms of its value. So here is a picture of it in use. This is one that they found in France that makes it look much more like a, well, a crazy animal, I guess, eh? Now you can see the size of it compared to the guy, but the noise it makes, as I said, is just, just phenomenal. Please do follow that link and, and listen to it. Another evidence for. Now we've got more archaeological evidence of this time decapitation of a body excavated in the Loch Ends Kist burial in East Lothian. A kist is a stone lined box under a burial mound. If you go into archaeology at university, you're going to learn all about kists. So in this uh, kist burial, we found a severed head uh, with the neck vertebrae showing evidence of deep sword cuts. And this has been argued to symbolize the completeness of the enemy's subjugation. If you're lopping off heads with swords and possibly axes and that kind of thing, then it shows that you are using the tools of war in your society. And if you're going to the, the bother of erecting a kist and putting a big fancy burial mound on the top of it, a lot of man hours of labor there or women hours as well. That shows a lot of effort. That shows that whatever you've done is very important to your society and at the heart of that event was a weapon of war. So this can be used to argue, yes, warfare and the tools of warfare can be argued to be important to any society as shown by the archaeological record. Now further evidence of what we've dug up about Aryan society shows heroic lordly practices of warfare. Now, as I said at the, the start of this wee section on reasons for, Prestige is a big deal in any society and the prestigious individuals of a tribe, the ones who want to mark themselves out as being richer, more successful, more powerful, special, different, they want to show off. Visually they want to show off, they want to give those markers. And it's not just about having yourself a fancy shield or a, a big sword or a just truly fabulous helmet. There's other stuff that comes with that too. And you want to deck out everything. So if you've got yourself a chariot, you've got yourself your big fancy helmet and you've got a metal sword, then the next thing that you can look to do is, well, what else can I do to my chariot? I can put fancy stuff on the horses. Oh my God. So this item is in the National Museum of Edinburgh. It is the Tor's pony cap. Now looking at it, I always used to look at this and think, wow, if they put that on the front of the horse's head, and its eyes went through these big holes at the side here. It would look like it had horns and it would be freaky if it was charging towards you. Having seen it in person now and uh, read more about descriptions of it, I believe that the ears go through uh, the, the holes at the side and it sits on top of the pony's head like a cap. Which I suppose still gives it horns, probably makes it look a, a little bit less frightening, but it's still fancy and would uh, be a mark of you showing off your wealth and also making you look a little bit otherworldly. My word, what if your chariot ponies have horns on them? It looks like you are from the spirit world rolling into the battlefield with these things on. So there are other ways to show off too. And clearly people are making the expense, making the effort. I mean, look at the, the craftsmanship in this. It's incredible to show off on the battlefield. So you can argue again from items like this, warfare must have been important to their society. They are expending so much effort and so much wealth in making them look good in this context, in the context of war. Now we're going to look at the reasons against warfare. So we've gone through all the reasons about people showing off, but the expense and the effort and the wealth that's been used to, to look good on the battlefield. And let's look at some of the reasons against. So what indicators in any society in Northern Britain in the 1st and 2nd century AD show us that perhaps warfare wasn't the be-all and end-all of their lives? 
So we learned a wee bit about this in our previous session on Hillforts, but warfare can be argued to be of secondary importance when we look at the construction of these giant monuments. These are the biggest things that survived to us from Iron Age culture in Northern Britain. And you can see just by their, their situation, by their size, by the construction, that not all of them are defensible. So this one is Chester's Hill Fort in Lothian, and you can see that the, the ridge that's wooded just above it in the picture here actually overlooks the hill fort and anyone on that with archers or slingers could rain down fire on the poor schmoes that uh, were hiding on the top of the hill fort. So as a defensible structure, it's a very, very poor choice for you to put all your eggs in that basket. But you can see they've clearly made the effort and there's thousands of man hours here in building all these ramparts to make this quite an imposing site. If you are approaching the hill fort from this track on the left hand side of the picture here, coming up from the valley floor and looking up at all these um, rows and rows of ramparts at the gateway, that would look incredibly impressive. So, you know, this is more about prestige, about showing off, than it is about uh, creating a defensible site. So therefore, if you're able to make defence a secondary concern when you're building yourself a tribal center like this hill fort here then surely you could argue warfare is not as prevalent as others argue on the other side of this argument and for other reasons against if we look at other RNA structures as we have been more recently in the course since hill forts RNA sites are built to display power and they can also have a ritual function if we look at roundhouses the doors often align to the rising sun um, so you could argue they're built more with a kind of spiritual purpose in mind. Brochs like this one shown here, the Brock of Mouse in Shetland. Giant big structure, you can see there's a wee fuzzy person there for our scale. Are useless to protect the defence because they're not built over wells. There's no way for you to store a considerable amount of water in there that means that you could last out any form of long term siege by an enemy. Many Iron Age sites seem to be constructed therefore with religion, prestige and ritual in mind rather than purely defence, even when we see a giant stone structure like a brock. For other reasons against, late Roman, or late pre-Roman I should say, Iron Age Britain was in fact settled and thriving, it seems from the archaeological record. We have open settlements dotted across the landscape. Now of course the, the population of Iron Age Northern Britain is nothing compared to what it is nowadays, so at most we're looking at a few hundred thousand people rather than the, the five and a quarter million people we have now. Even so, without cities per se clustering across the landscape, it's far more likely that we have a picture of people spread evenly across the, the valleys of Northern Britain, um, scraping their, their living off the land, farming it through animals or pastoral farming or growing crops. And these are the settlements they tend to live in. Now the fact they're open and they're not surrounded by enclosure tells us that they're not scared of being attacked. So that indicates to us Warfare cannot have been a pressing everyday concern for these people. They have not sought to defend their homes, so therefore we can argue there isn't a prevalent threat all the time. So the modern picture stories are formed of our society is one of stability, of undefended farms, wholesale land cultivation and stability across the landscape. In terms of what the Iron Age landscape actually looked like as well, this picture is a fair, fairly good representation, I guess, in that it's not, as Hollywood may uh, suggest, a heavily densely forested landscape, uncultivated by man. By the time we're getting to the late pre-Roman Iron Age, around about 0 AD, we have had Bronze Age farmers on the landscape putting down roots, setting up farms for more than a thousand years. And during that time, they are going to be harvesting the landscape for wood to build themselves dwellings like these and obviously to burn for fuel, to build boats and clear land so they can plant their crops or have grazing land for their, their animals. So the landscape is going to be fairly cleared. Now, David Brees has argued this in his book on the Antonine Wall, that uh, when the Romans got up to Northern Britain it probably looked very much like this uh, photograph here that we had, yeah, outcrops of trees and there would have been forests, yes, but there would have been a lot of cleared land, a lot of field and pasture uh, that would have been used for farming by the, the local populace already. Now, there's another YouTube video here that allows you to go off uh, with one of the BBC's famous archaeologists to go and see what it was like to live in an Iron Age farm. So I recommend you go and have a wee look at that if you follow the link. Now for other reasons against pre-battle preening, ritualised aggression and the threat of violence may have played a great role or as great a role as actual warfare in late pre-Roman Iron Age society. We have this horrible vision of the Hollywood number again of these terribly barbarous people painting themselves blue and running into battle, possibly naked. 
that kind of comes from the Romans in their the kind of bias view. Obviously, they're the, the written sources that we have something surviving. Interestingly, the word Britain, if you read some of the books the, where etymologists get to it and they kind of break the root of the word down, it seems to come from the word Britanni, which means the painted people. So, yes, I guess from that name, there must have been some evidence that the people of Britain were tattooing themselves or donning war paint, as it were. The blue stuff that they put on their faces was, or on their bodies, was a pigment called wood. It was blue, yeah. And the purpose of it, other than scaring your enemies with horrible, nasty pictures on your body and making yourself look a little bit like, ooh, um, edgy and dangerous, the wood on your skin actually acts as a antibacterial kind of disinfectant. So if you were to be wounded in a battle, fingers crossed the wood would actually help to keep the wound clean and reduce the likelihood of you getting an infection that would kill you after the battle if you weren't done in during the fight itself. So there is a method in their madness, as you could um, argue. But showing off in that way anyway, uh, as the argument goes here, is just as important as the fight itself. I mentioned this in the reasons for fighting, that yes, we were getting together, there were staging armies against each other, but it would be fought out between uh, a champion on either side. You could equally use that argument as a reason against warfare. The big fight that they're staging those massed armies against each other for doesn't happen because it's all about showing off. It's all about strutting, about showing your business, showing who's the hardest person. Maybe one or two guys have a fight to, to fight out between them and that's it. So the, the emphasis here is on showing off. It's, a, it's about prestige. It's almost like when you see two cats meet in the street and they all screech at each other. There might not be much fighting. There's a lot of posturing, a lot of squealing, but then one cat saunters off because it lost. Maybe this is what's happening in Iron Age British society. So further evidence against. Defences on sites such as at Houndham Rings and the borders, Broxmouth and East Lothian are in disrepair by the late Roman Iron Age, or late pre-Roman Iron Age. So this is evidence for us that society is essentially peaceful with little needed defences. If you look at a map of the British Isles that shows where hill forts are found, you see there are really, really dense clusters of hill forts in Wales. And the heaviest density of hill forts is in the hills of southeastern Scotland and the borders of Scotland going across into Northumberland. So it shows there if they're building so many of them, the role of some of these hill forts did necessarily have some kind of defensive purpose in it. So the clustering of hill forts there can be argued that there must have been a lot of conflict, there must have been a lot of warfare, there must have been a lot of division in the landscape back then. The fact that these sites are archaeologically shown to have been left just to go to seed, they've just been grassing over and just left by these people by the time the Romans are about to arrive. Shows that, yes, Iron Age society may have been warlike in its earlier days, but by the time we're getting to around about the 1st century BC into the 1st century AD, that society's moved on. These people aren't using these hill forts anymore. They are living down the valley floor instead. They don't have to climb a giant hill just to get home every day uh, because it's, it's easier. And because perhaps that threat of violence, that threat of attack has gone. Society, it can be argued, is, as shown by the lack of occupation of hill forts, much more peaceful. We can also see a change in those settlements that are occupying the valley floors. Now we get a transition from palisaded sites. Now that means basically a kind of farmstead, so it might be a couple of huts, maybe more than a couple of huts, but surrounded by some form of ditch, bank, or palisade is basically like in a wooden fence, often mounted on top of a uh, bank. But that's to basically defend your settlement. So earlier sites, yes, do have palisades around them. And when we come across this phrase, valate, valate is basically Latin for a wall. Uh, Multivalate means it's surrounded by several banks, ditches, or walls. And univalate means it's got one. So when we see sites transitioning from palisaded with lots of walls and banks and ditches around about it to protect it to enclosed by a single fence to finally just open like the huts in this picture here. That suggests that warfare is becoming less and less and less important in this society. So aerial photography can also be used to back up this argument. Now here we've got a picture of a hill fort up in the top right, but down in the bottom left, these shapes on the hillside are called cord rigs. These are ploughed fields. A cord rig, if you imagine, if you've ever had a corded item of clothing, you know, like the kind of like ridges of material that you, you get on the, 
on the trousers or the jacket, whatever it is, that's what the field surface looks like from above on a cord rig field. Because it's been ploughed and ploughed and ploughed, it has this rippled effect, almost like a corrugated roof on a shed. So the, the rig is the field and the cord is the shape of the furrows when the thing's been ploughed. And you can see all those little squares and rectangles and whatnot down the bottom left of this picture. Those are the fields that would have fed the people that live up on that hill floor up there. If we're finding field systems like this, and we often need aerial photography to do it because they're tough to see on the ground just at ground level, especially when a lot of them have been ploughed over by modern farmers. If we find systems like this and we have a sophisticated farming system taking place, it shows that these farmers are investing massive resources and effort into farming the landscape. And if you've got raiders or hostile tribes or invaders coming in that are going to hit your community and steal your stuff, take your people as slaves, burn your houses down, steal your animals or kill your animals and steal your grain, then you are not going to have the resources to run big field systems like this. You're going to be spending your time instead enclosing your farmsteads, training your warriors, keeping your animals safe. You're not going to be having this big map of fields planted round about your settlements. So the existence of these field systems shows us that there must have been a fairly sophisticated farming society that must have, by definition, therefore been quite peaceful to allow that to happen. So further evidence against trappings of warfare excavated by archaeologists, so the stuff we saw earlier on with chariots, swords and spears, may just have been the symbols of power rather than actual weapons of war. So it's something akin to the power of suggestion. So we, if we can think of chiefs of the tribe, when the previous chief snuffs it, and the, the new guy steps up and takes the reins of power, he inherits all the, the paraphernalia, all the stuff. So I guess a uh, kind of slightly more modern parable would be almost like a king. So when his dad dies, he takes the crown, he takes the scepter, he takes the fancy robes, he looks the part. This is what possibly you could argue is happening in our new society. So the people then who are at the top of the, I guess, the hierarchical ladder have all the stuff that goes with it. So they wear the hat, they wear the, the fancy chains, they've got the, the chariot to scoot around in. Uh, they might have only been used at festivals and ceremonies to, to symbolise their power. I doubt on your average Monday they pulled on all their fancy clobber. But there it is. It might have just been about prestige and about showing off your wealth and your power and your status within the community rather than actually using these items for war. Now, I don't have a picture of it here, uh, sadly, but the, the most famous, I guess, Iron Age relic that's been found in Britain is something called the Battersea Shield. It was dragged out of the River Thames in London over 100 years ago now, and it is a bronze shield studded with gems, and it looks absolutely fabulous. Gorgeous, beautiful artifacts must have taken an artist to make that thing and then some but it would have been heavy and unwieldy because it's made fully of metal or of precious gems and the odds of you wanting to take it into battle so some big hairy bloke can come along and lump it with a giant hammer or cut it with an axe is fairly minimal because you'd be literally just watching your wealth fall apart in front of you so that is very much an item of prestige and i was showing off possibly that's why it's in the river maybe it was uh, made to be super fancy as an offering to the gods but that's that's later and of course we get to that so further evidence against comes um, from the roman sources now, as i talked about before our major roman source for northern britain at this time is Tacitus. I remember he's writing a biography about his father-in-law Agricola, who was the general of the, the major Roman invasion into Northern Britain. Celts in these written sources are perceived of as very warlike to the Roman writers. If you think about it, the Roman writers, on the whole, haven't come to Britain. So they are sitting in their uh, writer's workshop in Rome, thousands of miles away from Northern Britain and the reality of what's on the ground. So they're going on I guess accounts from people who may have been there and it's kind of feeding back to them or people sending letters or what it's about so that it might be very heavily influenced by stereotyping or people amping up the story to make it more impressive and they are guilty of doing that themselves as well so if the romans are invading a land they need the enemies for propaganda purposes for the folks back home to know that the soldiers are working hard they need the enemy to look scary so the Roman writers thought to emphasise the role of warfare in Northern Britain to make the Northern British people look like a dangerous foe. 
So it was going to be quite the achievement for the Roman army in Britain to overcome them and to conquer that landscape. That meant that the generals of the Roman army would therefore acquire far more prestige themselves, far more glory from conquering uh, Northern Britain. And it meant there would be more respect to the soldiers given. And it would also make the empire itself look more powerful and more imposing because look at these scary people the empire could overcome. So the Romans need their enemies to look scary and bad and probably do considerably amp up the kind of militaristic aspect of uh, Iron Age Northern Britain to make their foe look appropriate to the challenge of Romans coming for them. There's another wee clip here again. Hopefully you're enjoying these as we go through. Please follow this one. This comes from a clip from this picture here from the HBO season Rome. Um, we see Roman legionaries going into battle against Gauls in this case to be fair but uh, as Celtic warriors would even close, I guess, to what the Romans would have experienced when they're fighting the native tribes of Northern Britain. You can see very much what ancient combat would have been like through this nice little short clip. Go and have a look. So further evidence of Roman bias comes from Roman writers like Dio. They fueled notions of the warlike Celtic society with no cultivated lands. Dio even reported that Northern Britons lived naked. Now, judging by the climate up here, then that's, that's, uh, you know, brave people. And apparently they fought barefoot as well. Now, I cannot imagine running across the Highlands barefoot. So, clearly, that's not going to be happening. So the Romans are amping up just how alien to the Roman way of life and just how barbaric these northerners seem because then not only do the enemy look like they are an imposing and almost superhuman foe to come up against, it also highlights just how different they are from Romans and when someone's very different from you and when a group of people seem very alien then it's easy to make them bad guys, it's easy to make them enemies and to, to achieve glory in the accounts for being seen to overcome this, this threat to Roman civilization and the proper way of civilized life. So as we can see from the, the session we're going through today there are contrasting views on the role of warfare and what it means to Iron Age society. Some modern thinking places warfare as being of only a secondary importance, falling after prestige, big deal in the Iron Age, and subsistence which means farming and basically making your living off the landscape. However, a new strand of thought coming through from more recent excavations is that imposing sites such as Mauser Brock, which we saw earlier on in the video here, uh, in Shetland, Eildon Hill North in the Scottish borders, or even Oakback Cranog in Loch Tay have in recent years been interpreted as indicators of warfare and instability. And this actually reinforces earlier views on warfare as being critical to society. So you see the views of archaeologists and of historians are quite split here. You can draw on lots of different arguments floating around on this point to build your own view when you are tackling source questions or essays and come to your own position on the real role of warfare in Iron Age society. Is it the most important thing that's going on? Or do you or are you going to argue that no, there's other, other characteristics of society at that time which could be argued to be more important? So for our historiography on the, the side of the course, Ian Armit is a big noise with his cold, dead eyes. He supposes that warfare was on a small scale and it was infused with symbolism. He's the one that argues that hill forts are not about warfare and it's all about ritual and uh, about society rather than building a giant big castle in the landscape. So Armit very much tamps down on the importance of warfare to Irish society. He thinks there are other more important things going on, specifically um, prestige and hierarchy within society. Armour also produced a work with Ralston and together they suggest that our agricultural cycle has got more importance than warfare in Iron Age society. So for him uh, and Ralston, it's all about farming land and living off the crops and maintaining that cycle and keeping it going. Building on that success, I guess, to, to build your population, to acquire surplus, which you could trade. So we know that Irish people did have a taste for the finer things, though this, this fabulous artwork they've got and these really expensive metal items. So to pay for these things, how do you do that? It probably comes through what you're producing on your farms. We've got Richard Hingley. He highlights the importance of kinship, of exchange, competition and community. So it's about how society works and how people work together rather than about how they fight together for him. And the more traditional view from Anna and Graham Ritchie stresses the existence of a warrior aristocracy which secured and maintained power through warfare. So for them, yes, it was very much about prestige and showing off, but it was about exerting that power and that was going to be done through warfare. So you've got 
the story's coming at it with different arguments on either side. Now for this video today, you are going to go ahead and advance our history course and use this information and you'll be able now to apply it to source questions and to apply it to essays. For source questions, you would be looking to get something specifically on the nature of warfare to use this material. With the essays, it might be more about the whole topic, so it's looking about what was the most important aspect about our new society of warfare, or was it something else? That's it for today guys, thanks very much.